Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to a Thursday night. It's Thursday night again and uh, we are on Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, I posted the link from Atsadi.com in the room and you can see that um, in the link it says Part 1A. And Psalm 89 is really long. It's, there are 52 verses. And um, you can see in the in the commentary there on the PDF on, on that page that there is a typo. I had Psalm 88 and I've changed that just a few minutes ago and so um next week's study it will be part b and then this week after that will be the rabbinic commentary midrash to halim and the uh so this psalm was pretty long and so i divided it in half i can i can do uh 25 maybe 30 verses at a time but when it gets to 52 that's just quite a bit and so um and i generally read through these so that i catch the con the the typos and stuff but um, yeah, and Ellie says, thou shalt not do typos. Yeah, <laughs> that's the 11th commandment, right? Okay, so um, before we begin, let's let's open with a word of prayer. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we could gather together, Lord, and study your word. We're thankful for having the freedoms to do so. Lord, we lift up a few people here tonight in, in prayer, Lord. We ask that you would be with Rabbi Marty and his wife and family, Lord, and they're going through a a very difficult time. I ask, Lord, that you would bring healing into their lives, into uh, Rabbi Marty's wife's life, Lord, that you heal her. Lord, I ask that you would also touch Clayton, that you would heal him of whatever he is suffering with, Lord, and I ask that you would do so in Yeshua's name. And Lord, we ask tonight that as we study your word, that you would speak to our hearts and help us to apply your word and, and these truths to our lives. And we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I posted the link in the room and you can see uh, there. I will, I'm going to read down through, I don't think I'm going to read through the whole psalm. I'll just read through the verses that we are looking at tonight. And so... That is starting on page 4, and from Psalm 89, and it says the following. It says, A masquil of Ethan the Ezraite. I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For I have said loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you, O Lord Almighty? Your faithfulness surround, also surrounds you. Your, yeah, yeah, your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You yourself crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all it contains, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, shout for joy at your name. You have a strong arm, your hand is mighty, your right hand is exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. How blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. O Lord, they walk in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all the day, and by your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of your strength, and by your father our horn or sorry, by your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our king to the Holy One of Israel. Once you spoke in vision to your godly ones and said, I have given help to one who is mighty, I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil I have anointed them, with whom my hand will be established, my arm also will strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the sons of wickedness afflict him. But I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him, and in my name his horn will be exalted. 
I shall also set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He will cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness will keep him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever in his throne as the days of heaven, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments. Okay, so I remember now. We we went to, to verse 29. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we went to verse twenty. I, I went. I went to verse twenty-nine because it seemed like verse thirty was on a down, uh, a, a downward. Um, it, it started a new thought because it says, "If his sons forsake my law and do not walk on my judgment." So, I think I, if I remember right, we only went to verse twenty-nine. So we'll stop right there. And so um, we come down in the study and uh, onto page seven. And you see it's labeled Part One A. Okay, so. In this week's study from Psalm 89, there are 52 verses, and the psalm opens and it says, A Maskeel of Ethan the Ezraite. And so when reading just the introductory line, the first question is, Who is Ethan the Ezraite? And so that led me to look up who Ethan might be. And Ethan the Ezraite is mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31, and he's said to be a wise man. He was not considered as wise as King Solomon, however, and the Tanakh describes Ethan as wiser than anyone else. In First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6, provides more information about Ethan. He had four brothers and was the son of Zerah, called um, Mahol, in First Kings chapter 4, verse 31. He was descended from the tribe of Levi. Ethan is mentioned in 1 Chronicles 15, verse 17, as being involved in bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Since he is called Ethan, the son of Cushai, Cushai so some, some Christian commentaries say that he is a different person from the author of Psalm 89. However, 1 Chronicles 15, 19 adds that the son of Cushai was a musician, one of the men to sound the bronze cymbals, and this had led some scholars to assume a link between the names mentioned in the scriptures, and these may be the same person. And it's also believed that Ethan was also known as Jeduthun in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 38 to 42. And therefore, he may also be, uh, possibly be associated with the titles of uh, Psalm 62 and 77. Okay, so... Well, uh, researching Ethan, uh, the rabbis connect Ethan the Ezraite, his psalm, to the acts of loving kindness, according to the Mishnah in the Mekilta. And on the bottom of page 7, the Mishnah Bartanura on Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, uh, verse 2, and part 6, it says, On the acts of loving kindness, as it is written, the world is built upon your kindness, and loving kindness is to regal grooms and to comfort mourners, re regal grooms and to comfort mourners, to visit the sick and enter the dead and the like. Hmm. I wonder if there's, a, there's some typos there. But uh, what was interesting about uh, the comments here from the Mishnah is that the Mishnah speaks of the acts of loving kindness, the Hasidim, as saying that the world is built upon Chesed, upon uh, the loving kindness of God. And grace, Chesed, is said to be the motivating factor for a person to comfort mourners and visit the sick and to draw near to the dead in the sense that one is dead who does not know the Lord God in heaven. Now in Mekilta, in chapter 31, verse 17, part 3, it says that he rested and was restored. From what did he rest? On the Shabbat, and from labor or from judgment. It is therefore written, and he was restored, which connotes from labor. We are hereby apprised that judgment never departs from him, and thus it is written, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth proceed, pro proceed from your countenance. And the rock, perfect is his work, for all of his ways are justice, etc. Okay, so the Shabbat, the Sabbath rest, is paralleled to Psalm 89, where righteousness and justice are the 
foundation of the throne of God. Grace and truth proceed from the presence of the Lord. The Lord provides rest for his people. He brings justice, mercy, and truth, which cause his people to be at peace with one another and with their enemies. Okay, so um, that was all I was able to find on Ethan the Ezraite. And I'm sure there was more, but you know, I'm limited on, on time and space. But the opening verse to the psalm in uh, verse 1, it says that I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known your faithfulness with my word. And so Ethan, who is a psalmist, he gives praise to the Lord as a result of his grace, his chesed. And it is because of the Lord's mercy that he is able to make known the faithfulness of God to all the generations. Now, Mikil, the Mikilta has the following to say concerning the chesed of the Lord. And I, I thought it was interesting to study what the rabbis have to say concerning the chesed of God, because his grace because um, and his loving kindness. Because they, they seem to um, put a lot of weight in the, uh, the concept of chesed. In the, in the idea that um, he sustains the world with his chesed. He's created the world with his chesed. And so the Mekilta, chapter 15, verse 13, part 1, it says the following. And we're on page 8. It says, and they're looking at Exodus 15, verse 13. It says, you have led forth in loving kindness and chesed. You have done chesed with us, for we were without redeeming deeds. The loving kindness of the Lord will I proclaim. The loving kindness of the Lord will I ever sing. And the world in its very beginning was built only with Hesed. I said that the world with Hesed will be built. This people whom you have redeemed, for all the world is yours, and you have no people but Israel, viz. This people have I created for myself, and thus it is written, Sixty are the queens, and eighty are the concubines. Sixty are the queens, these are the sixty uh, these are the sixty ten thousands of Israel who left Egypt, and eighty the concubines, those below the age of twenty, and young maids without number. The minors who are numberless, notwithstanding this only one is my dove, Moses, who countervails them all. Once Rebbe was sitting and expounding that one woman bore sixty ten thousands, when the disciple interjected, Rebbe, who, Rebbe, who is greater, the world or the tzaddik? And Rebbe replied, the Tzaddik. And how so? When Yocheved bore Moshe, he countervailed the entire world. And where do we find that Moshe countervailed the entire world? In Numbers 26, verse 4, As the Lord commended Moshe and the children of Israel, and then sang Moshe and the children of Israel. And there arose no prophet in Israel like Moshe. You have guided them in your strength and in the merit of the Torah which they are destined to receive strength being Torah viz the Lord will give strength to his people the Lord will bless his people with peace and the strength of the king you know for example is the Torah who loves justice okay so that that was the Makilta chapter 15 verse 13 part 1 and so according to the Makilta, the chesed, or the grace of God, is given without the need for redeeming deeds of the people. And this seems to be the definition of grace, you know, the unmerited favor of God according to the apostolic writings. And so you know, we find some consistency here between what the rabbis are saying and how they understand chesed as opposed to um, how we understand chesed today according to the apostolic writings. Now the rabbis say the world was created being built with chesed. And the Mekilta connects the grace of God to building the world upon chesed and to the people who were delivered from Egypt and to the tzaddik, the righteous one, and to Moshe in the Torah. And they say, you have guided them, and this is a quote from the Mekilta, you have guided them in your strength, in the merit of the Torah, which they are destined to receive. Strength being Torah, viz, the Lord will give strength to his people, the Lord will bless his people with peace. And the strength of the king, the Torah, who lives or who loves justice. Okay, so the way of God is justice and truth, and these are the things that are taught in the Torah. And this is why it is said that the strength of the king is who loves justice. The law of God established justice among his people, something that was unknown by the nations. 
The psalm says in Psalm 89, verse 2, For I have said, loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. And I really think this connects to the previous discussion with regard to uh, Psalm 89, verse 1, and then in the context of what we what we read here in the Makilta. Because when we ask the question, what does it mean loving kindness will be built up forever? You know, his God's chesed will be built up forever. What does that mean? And then uh, when we look at verse 2, and, and how does the Lord establish faithfulness in the heavens? You know, what does that mean? And it's I feel it's very important to remember the Torah context of what is being said and ask the Lord God declaring, or sorry, and um, let me reread that here. Um, I think it's very important to remember the Torah context of what is being said and asked. And the Lord God declared his mercy and grace from the heavens at Sinai as a starting point. And um, the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot has the following to say concerning faithfulness in the heavens. And it says here on page 9, Rabbi Mir says, Anyone who involves himself in Torah for its own sake merits many things, and moreover, the entire world is worthwhile for his sake. He is called a friend, beloved lover of the omniscient, omnipresent, lover of all creatures, delighter of the omnipresent, delighter of all creatures. He is clothed in humility and reverence, and it appear and in he prepares it prepares him to be righteous, devout, upright, and trustworthy, and it distances him from sin and draws him near to merit. We enjoy from him counsel and comprehension, understanding and strength, as it is said in Proverbs eight fourteen, mine is counsel and comprehension, I am understanding, mine is strength. It gives him kingship and dominion, and the ability to investigate in judgment, and the secrets of the Torah are revealed to him, and he becomes like an, eve, an ever-strengthening spring, and like a river that does not stop. He is modest and long-tempered, and forgives insult to him, and it enlarges him and raises him above all that God made. Okay, so, um, Pirkei Avot, wow, you know, that that is quite... The description of the one who involves himself in Torah study, don't you think? And note how the Mishnah invokes studying and performing acts based upon the Torah simply for the sake of doing what the Lord desires for us to do, to live by his statutes and his precepts, and to be free from sin. The Mishnah states that the one who seeks to live for God according to his Torah is called a friend, beloved, lover of the Lord in heaven and of all creatures. He is clothed in humility and reverence and prepares himself to live in righteousness. He is upright, trustworthy, and distances uh, distances himself from sin. Now, um, there was something I was going to comment on. I thought that I, w I was going to um, comment on this, but... Um, it's what I thought was interesting is that when when we read on in the Makilta and the rabbi's description of the strength God gives strength to his people and it is found in the the strength of the king is the Torah because the one who loves is is related to the one who loves justice and um when we when we read with regard to what the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot actually says, and it is describing this man, the person, you know, man or woman that um, that occupies himself with studying Torah simply for the sake of of doing what the Lord wants, and because we love Him, that such a person has uh, he is called a friend, and he is beloved. He is humble. And he, it says he has a long, a, a, you know, a slow temper, and that he he forgives insult to him. And you know, I I really think that that is strength. I think that that it takes a lot of will, power, and strength, and um, wisdom and humility to forgive an insult. You know, the, the easiest thing to do is just to snap back and just put someone else down. But, uh, you know, according to what we've been studying here and what Ethan is saying in his psalm, he says that 
Let me read Psalm verse 1 and 2 again. It says that, uh, let me come up here. Um, I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever to all generations. I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. And in verse 2, for I have said loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. And so um, when, and the rabbis, they say that this is a, this is the the strength of God, you know. And and if we if we are uh, we love the Lord and and we we seek Him in His Messiah in Yeshua, and he, he gives us His Spirit, He empowers us to do all these things. I I believe that, and I, I believe that is the whole meaning of I, Jeremiah thirty one that He writes His Torah on our hearts that and He is empowering us and strengthening us to to walk in His ways and um, to love others. And Ellie says, personal insult we can ignore, but insults that hurt God's character. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that's, that's sometimes, that's really hard. You know, we've got to take a stand. But um, now the rabbis, they go on to say in the Mishnah in Pure Cal vote 610, that God's throne is in heaven and the earth is his footstool. And then you can see on page 10, you know, we've got a Mishnah, Pure Cal vote, chapter 6, verse 10. It says the following. It says, five possessions has the Holy One, blessed be he, declared his own in his world and they are the torah is one possession heaven and earth are one possession abraham is one possession israel is one possession and the sanctuary is one possession from where do we infer that the torah is one possession for it is written the lord possessed me at the beginning of his ways the first of his of old and from where do we infer that heaven and earth are one possession for it is written, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Which house might you build for me, and which place might be my resting place? And it also says, How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have made them all. Full is the earth, your, pos your possession. From where do we infer that Abraham is one possession? For it is written, And Melchizedek blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram, of God most high maker of heaven and earth Genesis 14:19 And from where do we infer that Israel was one possession for it is written till your people pass over O Lord till the people pass over whom you have made your own and it also says as for the holy that are in the earth they are the exalted in whom is all my delight and from where do we infer that the sanctuary is one possession for it is written the sanctuary O Lord that your hands have established and it is also said, and he brought them to his holy border, to the mountain which his right hand had possessed. Okay, so that was uh, the Mishnah, Pirkei Avot, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, or part 10. Verse 10 or part 10, it's hard to tell, um, tract 8, 10. Or, but um, the Mishnah states that the heaven and earth are the possession of God because his throne is in heaven and the earth is his footstool. And the psalm says in Psalm uh, 89, verse 2, For I have said, Loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. Meaning that the Lord establishes his faithfulness because he sits above heaven and earth and is not subject to the whims of man. His faithfulness is established because he has spoken of his faithfulness in his word and he has demonstrated his faithfulness in his deeds. The word of God is eternal. It is everlasting. And therefore, the Lord has established his mercy and his faithfulness forever because He loves, because of his love for us. And the psalm continues. And, you know, I, I believe that, you know, it, I'm so thankful for the faithfulness that God has for me. You know, and I, I can um, really see what the psalmist is saying here is that, um, in all the many ways that God has protected me over the years, that um, he is and has remained faithful. And uh, for that, we just, we just give glory to his name, you know. Now the psalm continues, and at the bottom of page 10, um, we read the Lord speaking prophetically through the psalmist. And he says in verses 3 through 4, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. So we read of the Davidic covenant, which refers to God's promises to David through the prophet Nathan. And um, when when I was looking at the psalm 
And what these verses are saying here, obviously, we're, um, it, it drew, uh, draws us to this idea of what were these promises that God had made. And this leads us to Second Samuel chapter 7 and um, the prophet Nathan. And these promises are summarized in First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 11 to 14, Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 16. And the covenant promise the Lord made with David was unconditional in the sense that uh, the Lord promised David and Israel that the Messiah would come from the descendants of David and from the tribe of Judah and would establish a kingdom that would endure forever. The Davidic covenant is unconditional in the sense that the Lord does not place conditions of obedience upon its fulfillment. And the surety of the promises made rests solely on the faithfulness of God. And there are several key points in, this, in the promises. And so I listed those points that I thought that were key and you can see that on page 11 there and it titles several key points in the Davidic covenant I got five of them here and one it says the Lord reaffirms the promise of the land that he made with Abraham and Moshe and it says in 2nd Samuel 7 verse 10 I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed Wicked people will not oppress them anymore. And number two, the Lord promises that David's son will succeed him as king of Israel and that his son Solomon would build a temple. So Second Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 13. I will rise, raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And number three is chapter 7 verse 13. It says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Number four, chapter seven, verse 16 from Second Samuel. It says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so what began as a promise that David's son Solomon would be blessed and build the temple turns into something different, the promise of an everlasting covenant. And then five, David's house, his kingdom and throne speaks of a future expectation of the Messiah from the lineage of David and that he will establish a kingdom from which he will reign. And so the reason the Lord swore this promise to David was because of this faithfulness to the Lord during, um, you know, his faithfulness to the Lord during his life, both before and after he became the king of Israel. And this illustrates the importance of our call before God to do the same, to live with faithfulness, righteousness, justice, and truth. And, you know, I feel the key is that we seek to do those things and we do the best that we can with the help of God, you know, in his spirit. And because uh, nobody's perfect, right? And But I believe that the key is to remain faithful, to believe in him, and to do what is right and live a righteous life in uh, justice and to have love for others and to uh, take care of the poor and the widows. And... Um, the psalmist then continues, and he speaks of the heavens, giving praise to the Lord, that none compare to the Lord who is in heaven, and that his faithfulness surrounds him. And so on page 11, at bottom, I quote from the psalm, and then page 12, the Targum, and then the Septuagint, and we'll read through that. And it says, The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord, a God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all those who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is like you? O mighty Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. When it when its waves rise, you still them. Okay, and so um, and then the Targum. And that's the rabbi's interpretation of uh, the Masoretic text. And so it's always interesting to try and listen to or see how the rabbis are interpreting these words of the psalmist. In Psalm 89 from the Targum, it says, And the heavens will confess your wonders, O Lord, also your truth in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the clouds can be set beside you, Lord? Who resembles the Lord in the multitudes of angels? God is mighty in the mysteries of the holy ones, sitting on the throne of glory, great and fearsome over all the angels who stand around him. 
O Lord God above the hosts of the height, who is like you in strength, O Lord, and your truth is around you. Okay. And then the Septuagint, the Greek translation, it says, The heavens shall declare thy wonders, O Lord, and thy truth in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens shall be compared to the Lord? And who shall be likened to the Lord among the sons of God? God is glorified in the council of the saints, great and terrible toward all that are round about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like to thee? Thou art mighty, O Lord, and thy truth is round about thee. Okay, so the rabbis translate the faithfulness that surrounds the Lord as a reference to the mystery of the holy ones and as the angels who stand around him. The Septuagint translates in a similar manner, saying that God is glorified in the council of the saints and great and terrible toward all that are around about him. And so um, Radak is a Jewish commentator, and he comments on Psalm 16 about the Holy Ones saying the following. And he says at the bottom of page 12, he says, And excellent ones, all my delight is in them. To those who are most excellent of heart among all the children of men, and better than they, my delight is in them to do them good, because they keep and do thy commandments. And for this reason he calls them holy and excellent. excellent. And according to the former interpretation, they interpret for the holy ones, uh, thus I am not worthy of thy goodness, but for the holy ones thy goodness is worthy. In my opinion, the words of the holy ones depend upon thou hast said to the Lord, meaning after thou hast said to the Lord that he is thy sovereign Lord, thou shouldst say also to the holy ones which are, are in the earth that thou wilt humble thyself before them and yield them yield them superiority over thyself and learn from their works and all is with a view to perfection that thou should learn the love of God and in this way our sages of blessed memory have said thou shalt fear the Lord thy God to multiply for example to multiply the disciples of the wise and he said and he says which are in the earth meaning walk in the steps of the holy ones whom thou shalt find in thy way and learn from their works in my opinion, excellent ones is not construct, for similar examples are to be found. Windows narrow, pleasant plants, and such alike. And what the rabbis are doing here is they're looking at these various uh, Hebrew words. And the meaning of the, of the holy ones and excellent in whom is all my delight is that one should love them and walk in their ways, viz. the holy ones which are on the earth, the way of the holy ones, the servants of God. I love, but the way of the others who serve other gods I hate, and I say. Okay, so that that was from Radak on Psalm uh, 16, verse 3, part 2. And the holy ones are interpreted as a reference to the people of God who are obedient to God's word, so they're Torah observant. And they are the wise ones who walk in the footsteps of God. Radak exhorts that we are to walk in their ways to be as they are in their service to the Lord. And the phrase, Kedosh Yisrael, the Holy One of Israel, is often a title that is frequently given by the prophet Isaiah. And it serves to place the sins of Israel's uh, society in contrast to God's moral perfection, um, like in Isaiah 30, verse 11. And expresses the absolute separation from evil. And the concept of being holy is to be set apart from the, com from the common the habitual or the profane. The word holy, kadosh, provides us with awesome magnificence in even what is terrible or dreadful as we read in Nehemiah and Psalms. And the word holy also draws with it the idea that the Lord being holy is the only one who is worthy of true worship and adoration since there is no rival in heaven or on earth that can compare to him, our Father in heaven. Notice how these concepts are all drawn together in Radak's commentary regarding the Holy Ones and the perspective of the psalmist saying in Psalm 89 verse 8, God is mighty in the mysteries of the Holy Ones, sitting on the throne of glory, great and fearsome over all the angels who stand around him. The way of the Lord is described as holy is an indication that he is infinitely and eternally set apart, known only of himself as I am that I am, and therefore, as being called holy, and being holy, the Lord is unique. He is to be hallowed and utterly sacred. 
It is difficult to find the words to describe the absolute magnificence of God in His holiness. Okay, so then uh, the psalm continues and it says, um, You yourself crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. And when I when we ran we run across this verse, the the first thing that um, you know for those who study Torah, you know the first thing is that what does the psalmist mean? But that by the Lord crushed Rahab, you know everyone remembers Rahab, right? And the Aramaic Targum states that you have crushed Rahab, that is wicked Pharaoh, like one slain by the sword with the might of your strong arm. You have scattered your enemies, and so the rabbis interpret this to refer to Pharaoh. And um, remember, in Psalm 87, verse 4, it says that I shall mention Rahab and Babylon among those who know me. Behold, Philistia, Tyre, and Ethiopia. This is one was born there. Okay, And so notice how Rahab is considered one who was not a part of Israel. However, she knew the Lord God and the Lord saved her and her household from destruction. Remember, she was that prostitute in Jericho. Rahab sought the Lord in heaven according to the way in which the Father had revealed on Sinai. She sought the Lord in his ways, and therefore she is said to have been born there in the place, Hamakom, and possibly be counted as the one of the holy ones of God. In Psalm 89, verse 10, the psalmist states that the Lord was, has broken Rahab to pieces as one who is slain by the sword. And could this be a reference to pride versus humility? humility? Because um, that's not the way we we understand the the Torah narrative on Rahab, right? And so I thought that maybe the psalmist is referring to with regard to the Lord breaking Rahab to pieces as one who's slain by the sword as a reference to pride versus humility. And the Targum interprets this as Pharaoh who his people and kingdom were broken to pieces by plagues and by the power of God's right hand. Okay? And the scattering of the enemies draws in the imagery of the firstborn being slain, and he and his army were broken into pieces at the Red Sea and were seen by the Israelites on the shore. All were dead. Now this was, uh, this was done as one slain with the sword, as the dead have no life, power, and strength to defend, who are trampled upon, crushed, bruised, and broken to pieces. All of these things may be a parallel to the Lord's breaking into pieces the proud and insolent, the deceiver, as Rahab may signify as a prostitute. And this is in contrast to the holiness of God, the Lord uh, breaking and destroying the works of the deceiver, the evil one, and spoiling his power. And this, very, this could very well refer to the Lord who humbles the proud. And um, that may be why Ethan, the psalmist, is writing of Rahab in this way. You know, at least that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> okay, so the psalm continues, and it says in verse 11 through 14, it says, The heavens are yours, the earth is also yours, the world and all it contains. You have founded them, the north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon shout for joy at your name. You have a strong arm. Your hand is mighty. Your right hand is exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. Okay. And in the, the Targum it states, Yours is the heaven, yea, yours is the earth. You have founded the world and all its contents. The deserts in the north and those who dwell in the south, you created them. Now, you know what's interesting? Is it the deserts in the north and those who dwell in the south? Well, what was in the north and what was in the south? We have Judah that was in the south and Benjamin. And you have the northern tribes. They are a desert because they were destroyed. It could be that maybe the rabbis are thinking that when they're translating this. And they're looking at the north and the south. But they say the deserts in the north and those who dwell in the south who created them. Tabor in the west and Hermon in the east sing praise to your name. 
Yours is the arm with strength. Your hand will be strong to redeem your people. Your right hand will be raised to perfect your sanctuary. Righteousness and justice are the dwelling place of your glorious throne. Favor and truth go before your face. And in the Septuagint, it states, The heavens are thine, and the earth is thine. Thou hast founded the world and the fullness of it. Thou hast created the north and the west. Um, Tabor and Hermon shall, shall rejoice in thy name. Thine is the mighty arm. Let your hand be strengthened. Let thy right hand be exalted. Justice and um, judgment are the establishment of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Okay, so... You know, the Septuagint, it leaves out the south and the east, and it just reports or speaks of the, the north and the west. Uh, that's interesting. I, did, I didn't talk about that, but, you know, there's things that we notice when we read through the scriptures again and again. But the psalmist describes the glory of God, and it's interesting how the Targum translates Psalm 89, verse 13 to say, Yours is the arm with strength. Your hand will be strong to redeem your people. Your right hand will be raised to perfect your sanctuary. And so what does it mean that the right hand of God rises up to perfect his sanctuary? Guys, anyone have any thoughts on that? Why, what does it mean that the right hand of God will raise raises up to perfect his sanctuary? A parallel thought may be to our bodies as a sanctuary and the Lord working in our lives to take away our sins and to transform our lives for his glory for a dwelling place you know yeah and Ellie says I see the right hand of God as the Messiah right you know and, and he does these things in his Messiah Yeshua right okay so Psalm the Psalm states in verse 14 uh, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne loving kindness and truth go before you now, the rabbinic commentaries have the following to say concerning righteousness and justice being the foundation of God's throne. It says in the Mishnah Hagiga 12a, part 33, With knowledge as it is written, with his knowledge the depths were broken up, with strength and might as it is written, with his strength he establishes the mountains, being girded about with might, with rebuke as it is written, the pillars of heaven tremble and are ast astonished at his rebuke, with righteousness and judgment, as it is written, righteousness and judgment are the foundation of your throne. With mercy and compassion, as it is written, remember your compassion, O Lord, and your mercies, for they are eternal. And Rabbi Judah said in the name of Rabbi Rav. Okay, so um, the Mishnah describes the power and the might of the Lord in heaven, and he is all-powerful, having created the heavens and the earth setting the mountains in place, and establishing the depths of the sea. Though in his great power, he is merciful, righteous, just, and compassionate. Now the rabbis in the Mishnah believe the mercies of the Lord are eternal based upon the Psalms. The Mekilta, it states, he rested and was restored. From what did he rest? On the Shabbat, and from labor or from judgment. It is therefore written, and he was restored, which connotes from labor we are hereby apprised with judgment never departs from him and thus it is written righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne loving kindness and truth precede your countenance the rock perfect is his work for all his ways are justice etc so the Mekilta asks the question of what the Lord rested from on the Shabbat from labor or from judgment and this is an important question since the conclusion is that the Lord rested from work as opposed to resting from judgment. The point is, is that we, we rest from work, from our labor, and not from doing righteousness and justice. We do not rest from these things, which is righteousness and justice, since the Shabbat is not a day given as a license for sin. And so when speaking of resting, uh, we are resting from work. And righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne, and his mercy and truth, precedes his presence and as his people we are called to do the same now the commentary Akidat Yitzhak it has the following to say and I got uh, I quoted from two parts of Akidat Yitzhak you can see here um, 6708 and 6775 and this is the following it says encouraging man to repent before God, the day of judgment 
is ever so much more helpful than to wait for the judgment and then attempt to reverse it. Therefore, the knowledge of when the day of judgment occurs affords us a chance to prepare for that day. When David proclaims, Hail the nation that knows the Teruah, they walk in the light of your countenance. He merely points out how fortunate we are to be able to put this knowledge to our advantage. The Talmud Rosh Hashanah 16 discusses timing of celestial judgments. Rabbi Yossi emphasizes that daily judgment of man occurs also, whereas Rabbi Yohanan makes the point that repentance even tears up the evil decree. When the question is raised that even myriads of sacrifices, if they are offered after the Day of Atonement, can no longer change the evil decree, the answer given is that this is so only in the case of individuals. Collective repentance of a congregation is accepted at all times. Okay, And then Akita Yitzhak 6775, it says, All the quotations in the Bible referring to this judgment confirm that the mighty deeds the mighty deals with uh, the sorry the almighty deals with us as if we were equals and had claims upon him in psalm 89:15 we read righteousness and justice are the abode of your throne kindness and mercy proceed from your presence all this is an acknowledgement that god has freely subjected himself to such rules there had been no legal reason for him to do so our approach, therefore, is to stress God's majesty rather than his, rather than his overlordship, ownership, etc., by means of the shofar to remind him of those of our meritorious de deeds which he should not ignore. The psalmist saying, Hail the people who understand the meaning of teruah, the sound of the shofar. They can expect to walk in the light of your favor is thus vindicated. Okay, so Akidak Yitzchak states that having the knowledge of a future judgment prepares us. We have the opportunity to prepare for the day. Many sacrifices do not change a decree of judgment because of the nature of the sin that led to the decree. The choice is to live in righteousness today and not wait until tomorrow. You know, The idea is to seek forgiveness and to seek the Lord and to repent and to turn. Um, it is the continual habitual sin that leads to judgment, which then is meant to lead the sinner to repentance, seeking the Lord for forgiveness and turning from sin to righteousness and justice. The presence of God is preceded by his mercy, kindness, and grace because he desires for us to turn from our evil ways without having to bring judgment as a motivating force. Akidat Yitzhak says that it is more important to stress God's majesty rather than his overlordship, ownership, etc. And the shofar is meant to remind the Lord of the Ma'asim Tovim in our lives, as opposed to the Ma'asim Ra'im. And the commentary states, Hail the people who understand the meaning of Teruah, the sound of the shofar. They can expect to walk in the light of your favor, where Teruah is a shout, a battle cry, or a shout of joy with religious impulse. And that uh, is from Brown Drivers and Briggs you know, lexicon. And so the concept here is of shouting with joy at the loving kindness of the Lord and all the mercies that he shows us each day. And then the psalm continues, and it says in Psalm um, 89, verse 15, How blessed are the people who know the joyful sound, O Lord. They walk in the light of your countenance. In your holy name, they rejoice all the day, and by your righteousness, they are exalted. That was verse 15 and 16. And so, um, you know, the question is, what is the joyful sound? And the joyful sound is that of the shofar. We were, we were just discussing previously. The phrase, um, the, the phrase, Ashrei Ha'am Yodea Teruah Adonai, may be translated as, Blessed are the people who know the shout of the Lord. And so, you know, the shout, you know, what is this shout but the praises of the people? You know, people are shouting for joy because of the, the salvation of God. And the righteousness of God is found in the commandments, living for the Lord, doing what is right, just and true, and having a love for one another. You know, just as what we're seeing, we see here in the apostolic writings. And um, these are the things that the Torah teaches us how to live before our Father and God in heaven. And by the Lord commanding his people to live according to his mitzvot, statutes and precepts. 
God's righteousness is found within the commands. And this is how the Lord, His righteousness, exalts His people. We become one in agreement with our Father in heaven when we walk in His ways and live our lives according to His Torah. And this is how the Lord's righteousness exalts the children of Israel. And so those who join themselves with Israel in the Messiah, Yeshua. And um, let's see. Okay. And so I was just looking in the room to see what was written. Okay. So um, the psalm continues in verse 17 through 19. It says, For you are the glory of your strength, and by your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord and our King to the Holy One of Israel. Once you have spoken in vision to your godly, godly ones and said, I have given help to the one who is mighty, I have exalted, exalted one chosen for the people. Okay, so, um, yeah, and Ellie says he dwells in the praise of his children, yeah. And I remember scripture, you know, there's scripture on that. But um, the question when we're reading the psalm here is what, vision did the Lord speak unto the godly ones and we had we had uh, studied here just a few moments ago that the godly ones is a reference to his people and so what vision has God spoken to his people now the Targum it translates it says that then you spoke in a vision to your pious ones and you said I have set up a helper for my people by the hand of the mighty in Torah I have set apart a youth from among the people so in, uh, so Isaiah explains the meaning of the Targum where the translation compares the Torah to the vision of God. So you know, what I did was I, I tried to find um, an example in the, in the scriptures that you have God revealing a vision or giving a vision to his people. And Isaiah is perfect. <laughs> but Isaiah, he, he seems to explain the meaning of the Targum where... You, you look at, let's read the Targum again. It says, Then you spoke in a vision to your pious ones, and you, said, I have, I, and you said, I have set up a helper for my people by the hand of one mighty in Torah. Okay? I have set apart a youth from among the people. Okay, so that is loaded with information right there. And we think about how God has given his helper, and this is Torah. Okay? And so Isaiah chapter 1 verses 1 through 17 it says the following a vision of isaiah the son of amos concerning judah and jerusalem which he saw during the reigns of uzziah jotham ahaz hezekiah kings of judah listen o heavens and hear o earth for the lord speaks sons i have reared and brought up but they have revolted against me an ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Alas, a sinful nation. People weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evil doers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. Where did where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. For the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandages, and bandaged, bandaged, nor softened with oil. Your, hand, your land is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation, as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts has left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multi multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me... Who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. In, incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. 
Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. Okay, so that was Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. And it's important to note what Isaiah stated in the opening of his book. He says that a vision is given and lists the time in which he lives by the kings who lived while the Lord worked through Isaiah. Isaiah says that the Lord had brought up sons, but they had rebelled against him, and that these sons, the people, do not have understanding. The people are a sinful nation, and Isaiah goes on to list the things seen in the vision and describes saying the Lord does not take pleasure in sacrifice. And the reason being, the Torah states, and if we look at Parashat Vayikra, okay, from the Torah, it states that the Lord desires obedience in the statements of if you sin. And this is this is really, really an interesting observation in the Torah, because in, in the book of Leviticus, we find over and over again that the Lord says that if you sin, then do this, that, and the other, okay? And, and there is no sacrifice for intentional sin. And Isaiah clarifies this when he says in verse 16 and 17, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. And plead for the widow. And the point is, is that when one lives in sin, trying to go through the motions is detestable to the Lord. And most Christian commentaries on this verse regarding the vision say that this is a reference to Nathan the prophet and, um, and David and his sin. However, you know, as you can see, there is a deeper Torah concept that is directly applicable to our lives. And the Targum translation brings out an interesting context in the difference on the interpretation of the vision, which has an application to our lives. And this is why it says here in, in the Targum in verse 20, then you spoke in a vision to your pious ones, and you said, I have set up a helper for my people by the hand of one mighty in Torah. I have set apart a youth from among the people. That the Lord has, um, I lost my train of thought. I was going to say something. Um, that the, um, the point, the, what was the point I was going to make? Give me a second here. Oh, Okay, so the, the point is is that there is related to the direct application to our lives and this the this helper that God has given to his people and um I believe that is the, the spirit of God, you know, in the Messiah that helps us to uh be free from sin and to live a life that is free from sin. And that means obedience, you know, obedience to his word. And I believe that um this is this is all connected then to that that application you know which is um which is torah and then the psalm continues and then uh we go through psalm uh 89 verse 21 to 29 and it says uh so we are we're coming to the end of the study here and so um it says the following it says with whom my hand will be established my arm also will strengthen him the enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. But I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him. And in my name his horn will be exalted. I shall also set my hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He will cry to me, You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of, of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever in his throne as the days of heaven. Okay, and then the Aramaic Targum, it says, Whom my hands are ready to help, truly my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not make him go astray. The sons of wickedness will not afflict him. And I will crush his oppressors before him, and I will smite his foes. And my truth and goodness are with him in the name of my word. His glory will be exalted, and I will place his dominion at the harbors of the sea and the might of his right hand on those who dwell by the rivers. He will call to me, You are my father, Abba, my God, and the strength of my redemption. 
also i will make him my firstborn of the kings of the house of judah the highest of the kings of the earth i will preserve my goodness to him forever and my covenant is constant for him and i will set up his sons forever in his throne for as many days as the heavens will last and then um the septuagint says says basically the same thing as the masoretic text and um so the psalm states in psalm 89 verse 21 it says with whom my hand will establish my arm also will strengthen him and with whom my hand will be established this seems to be the way of saying that such is the man who has set the lord god in heaven as his rock and as the one in whom he trusts and this is a promise of god's gracious presence in the life of the one who has placed his faith in the messiah yeshua and who seeks to walk in the father's ways my and he says that my arm also will strengthen him and and this is a statement of the Lord working in the life of the believer, his support and holding him up by his power and grace. And the Targum states, whom my hands are ready to help, truly my arm will strengthen him, saying that the hand of the Lord will help, which is confirmed by saying his hand will strengthen him. And this shows the greatness of God and his love for us. The arm of the Lord moves just as he moved in the deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And this is the manner in which such a man calls out to the Lord. He says in Psalm 89 verse 26 through 29, it says, He will cry out to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall keep make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever in his throne as the days of heaven. Okay, so, um, and in the closing thought, and that was the end of the psalm commentary, is that do you cry out to the Lord as the psalmist does? You know, and I think that's a good, good, something good to think about, you know, for our lives. And so, um, for each one of us, it's like, um, you know, do I love, am I doing, you know, am I doing that? Am I? by thinking about how much the Lord has has done for me and how he is sustaining me, you know. Okay, so that, that concludes the, the Psalm study part 1A. And so let's close with prayer and then I'll open a mic. Heavenly Father, truly you are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. We praise your holy name, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for empowering us to live our lives for your glory. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that you have placed in our hearts to serve and to live our lives for you. We thank you, Lord, for the promises you have made and your continued faithfulness to your promises to us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua the Messiah and for always calling our hearts back to you. Please have mercy on us. Forgive us for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Yeshua, that we may enter into the covenant of peace that you have promised to your people. Help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name and give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay.